Well, today we are continuing on in the book of Mark, as Jessica just read. We're going to be going through this story that she just read and the very next story, which some of you might think, how, how are those two connected? I'm going to show you here in a second. But I don't know if you've noticed, but kind of taking the headlines around the world is that um, the, the Queen of England has passed away and her son, Charles III, is now a, the new king. Like for the first time in, in a long time, there's a king in England and you know, if I didn't know the current events or if I, you know, or, you know, they're just in the current events. So you got to, in a way, talk about it. But I don't know how else to intro that. But interestingly enough, our story today talks about the arrival of a king. And in case you didn't know, again, King Charles III, that's how he's, uh, he's being referenced as now. That was one of the first things he did. And there's several, I was reading up on, you know, monarchies in the UK or whatever because... I don't know much about them, but there's a couple different ceremonies. And, and the first ceremony is the Ascension Council. And that's where he gets together with the, a group of people. And they basically just say, okay, you are the new king of England. And he, isn't, he hasn't had his coronation ceremony. That will probably come sometime in 2023, they said. And that's not uncommon. I guess the last time they did that, they waited several years, or se- almost a year and a half between um, sta- stating that this person is king and then um, coronating them or queen and then coronating her as queen. And so um, that's going to be coming up here in a, in a little bit in our story in a way. And, and I, when, when the coronation happens, I'm gonna, probably going to watch at some level with maybe some people in this room, but there's going to be parts of the ceremony. This is going to be an important event, right? It's going to be all over television. Everyone in UK is probably going to be lining the streets waiting to see King Charles come in in his coronation ceremony. Um, one of the things he did at, his, at this accession council was he said that he will uphold the constitution um, of, of, his, of his government, and then he also said that he would um, make sure to um, uphold the, the Church of Scotland, right? to preserve the Church of Scotland. So a couple different things in his declaration. I guess also when you get named king, you get to announce what you're called, which is pretty interesting. So he said Charles III. I guess he could have chose between four different names, all right? This is just a quick, you know, little, little Google search. So you could learn this as well. <laughs> Charles, Philip, Arthur, or George. He could have chose any one of those, and I'm glad he went with Charles, all right? But um, for just that's, we're going to leave that there, okay? So king, monarchy, that's kind of been on the headlines around the world. And, and here in our story, we have been leading up to Jesus going to Jerusalem. In fact, in the end of chapter 8, Jesus basically said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, Well, you're the Messiah, which means you're the long-awaited king. You are the anointed one. You're the one who's going to come and restore the kingdom. And Jesus said, Great, that's right. But the king, though, will suffer, will be betrayed, he'll be killed, and then he will rise on the third day. And Peter didn't understand understand that and started to rebuke him. And so Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And we've seen several different cases where Jesus will predict his death, talking about him as this Messiah, this son of man, this one who have authority and power and dominion. But he says, this will be a different kind of kingdom, but we're going to Jerusalem. And this is where we're headed. And last week when Bev, or two weeks ago when Bev shared, they're on their way to Jerusalem now. They're no longer in the northern area of the Sea of Galilee. They are now close to, uh, outside of the Jordan River. Again, where. um where John the Baptist was ministering. And now in our story today, they're in, they're in Jericho. And ultimately they will, at the end of our time together today, they will be entering into Jerusalem. And this is where the king is supposed to be. If he truly is the Messiah, again, that word means king, or they thought of it as king, the anointed one. All right, then the king should be in the king's city, the city of David, the city of the king, which is Jerusalem. And so that's why he is on his way to Jerusalem. But remember, Jerusalem is a difficult journey ahead. It's not marked with um, tons of, of lavish ceremonies with um, expensive food, and expensive decorations like I'm sure the coronation of King Charles III will be, like a tons of money and resources thrown out. In fact, I guess he's had this thing planned for years according to this, so it's going to be a doozy. All right, but for Jesus, the entrance into Jerusalem and, and the end of Jerusalem, his coronation is him nailed to a cross with a crown shoved on his head made of thorns, and above him says, King of the Jews. That's how Jesus' coronation will end. But according to his proclamations, it doesn't end on the cross. He is risen three days later, and he is seated with glory and power and dominion. We got some claps in the house this morning. Woo, love it. 
But Jerusalem, the journey there, marks the way in which Mark, in our case, in our story, and the other gospel writers will say something about Jesus being king. And we get the first little take of it in that story. And I love that little story of, of Bartimaeus being healed. I don't know if you've ever read that before, but it's very interesting. Uh, Jessica read it for us there. They come to this town of Jericho. There's a great crowd. These are all kind of things we've read before. He goes into a town and a great crowd. You're like, yeah, we've seen that over and over and over again. And this time, I love it. It's a man who can't see Jesus, who knows exactly who he is and says, son of David, have mercy on me. And they rebuked him, be silent. But he cried out all the more. Don't you love that? Don't stop, stop calling out to Jesus. And this person who knows who he is, understands this is the son of David, will cry out even more to the point where Jesus says, call him. And what does he do when he gets up? He throws off his cloak. Remember a few weeks ago when the rich young ruler, some of the texts call it, he's, he's the guy who had all the money. And Jesus, he says, what must I do? And he says, well, go sell everything to the poor and come and follow me. And he looked and walked away sad because he had much wealth. Well, here in the story, this blind beggar, which means he doesn't have a lot of wealth, the only income he gets is by begging from people, throws his cloak off, which could be potentially the place where he sits on the ground full of the money where people drop in, or maybe it's just a sense of security, or maybe he only has one cloak because back then they didn't have closet full of cloaks for fall, for for winter, and for a light breezy, you know, night on the town. Or for Oregon, a rain jacket, four of them always ready to go, okay? So they had all these cloaks, and and he goes and he throws the cloak to the side. Now, if he's blind, is he going to know where to go back and find that cloak? Probably not. Some of you said someone would help him out, maybe, all right? But not the person he's been begging from for the last five or six years or whatever. And he goes to Jesus, and Jesus asks the question, so amazing, what do you want me to do for you? And this is kind of the the crossroads for this man. This is the chance for him to say what he really wants. But saying what he really wants will give up his whole life. Think about it. The second he asks for sight, that is the exact second he's no longer a beggar. He no longer asks for money to make money. He no longer sits down doing the same old thing again. In other words, his life is going to completely change. So he's at that crossroads. And so he asks him, he says, Rabbi or teacher, uh, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, get, or so go your way. The other translation says, get up and go. Your faith has made you well. As if to say, faith is the thing that matters here. We've been saying this all along. I don't know if you've been coming with us for the last 34 weeks. Today's week 35, in case you're counting with me. But 35 weeks in the book of Mark, the question of faith has always been coming up. And it's not about how much you own. It's not about the right things you say. It's about the faith that you have in Jesus. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. He says, and immediately, because Mark always says immediately. You've got to love that. That's number 433 times. I'm just kidding. I don't know how many, but there's a lot. Immediately, he recovered his sight. And followed him on the way. Remember the the rich young ruler, go sell everything, give to the poor, and follow me. He walked away sad because he had too much wealth. In other words, he money and wealth was was an idol to him. He wasn't willing to cast his idol to the wind to follow Jesus. Now the guy throws his cloak and goes, I want my sight back. He receives it, and he's following Jesus. Where? To Jerusalem for the coronation ceremony where he will be hung on a cross. Now we get to the next story. I love it. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. 
So how many of you have heard that story before? Okay, several hands. If you haven't heard that, that is the traditional Palm Sunday message, right? Those 11 verses in the book of Matthew, the whole crowd is shaking so much that the city is stirred and they answer the, ask the question, who is this, right? And so this is the story of Jesus in, uh, entering Jerusalem as king. And so as we connect these two stories, I'm going to try to do that for a little bit and then I'm going to challenge us with some questions based on how we connect these two stories. But here, uh, the, the first way that we can connect the stories is with the question about identity, right? So who is Jesus? Well, I think both stories are saying something about this, and I think they're both saying that he is the true king. If you're taking notes, and I, I want to highlight these, if you're in our life group, these are the notes that we use for our life group. So if you fill out your little sermon notes here on these little fill-in-the-blanks, then you open these up sometime between now and your life group, and you can do all the, the questions in here and get ready to bring your answers to the life group and be able to share with others. Um, this is what we use. And then on the back, there's a little purpose of life groups there. So just wanted to give you um, a heads up of why these changed a little bit in case you were wondering, okay? Because they used to just be one half sheet. Now they're a folding one. Ooh, isn't that cool? All right. <laughs> but Jesus is the true king. The blind beggar gets it. Right? He says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Twice the blind beggar, Bartimaeus, refers to Jesus as the Son of David. So he's making the connection here. He has, for some reason, this, the man who has no sight has remarkable insight into the true identity of Jesus. And in a way, the readers or hearers of the story are now prepared for Jesus' approach to Jerusalem, where he will be heralded as the Davidic king. So in a way, as Mark's writing this gospel, he's, he's saying, okay, this story, finally, we've been, we've been talking about this along the way, right? To follow Jesus, you need, you need ears that are willing to hear. You need eyes that are open to see, hearts that are softened to receive. And here, the blind man sees or knows who Jesus is without any sight. He has insight without sight, which is pretty cool. Um, and he understands this. And so Mark is setting us up for going into Jerusalem. The blind man gets it. He has the right faith. And now we're going in and Jesus will be hailed king. And he was there when he said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name uh, of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the coming of, or in the name of our father, or blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Some other things that show that he is the true king. Um, Jesus rides in on a colt, right? The fool of a donkey, in case you have that translation, right? The colt, this is an Old Testament prophecy spoken of in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Here it says there, the prophet writes, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. In other words, a little baby donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations, and his rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. So for Jesus to be riding in on a little baby donkey is a way in which the people would understand he is the king, the true king, the one in the line that's prophesied here in Zechariah, coming to proclaim peace to the nations, victorious, lowly, humble, on a donkey. Another thing that makes him king in this story is the cloaks on the road. Now, the blind man threw his cloak to the side. I don't know if that has any connection with, with, him being, with him thinking Jesus is king. We know that he says son of David, which obviously is a connection. There is no other David in the, in the Old Testament or in, the, in that time. Well, there are other Davids, okay, but none matches up to King David. You don't call someone the son of David down the street around the corner. Like, this is King David, all right? But here, they threw cloaks on the road. Now, the question is, are you going to throw your cloak in front of a donkey, no, seriously, would you just take, oh, here comes a donkey. Yeah, I'm going to throw, that, my, throw my coat out there. You're one raincoat, or maybe you're one of five because you live in Oregon, right? Are you going to take, no. You guys know what donkeys do, right? Okay. <laughs> or what they do do. I mean, however you want to say it, all right? Do you, for a friend, no, I love some of you in this room, but I'm not going to throw down my coat for a donkey to step on it, right? For a family member, Oh, uh, it's one of those weird cousins, probably not, but uh, I'm just kidding. That was, that was a reference to a few weeks ago, okay? Only for a king do you take off your cloak, potentially your one cloak, and lay it down before him as he's entering in to his kingdom. 
2 Kings 9, 13, they quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. And then they blew the trumpet and shouted, Jehu is king. This is an echo of an Old Testament story when people laid down their property, laid down the cloak that they owned underneath for loyalty and allegiance to Jehu, who was king in 2 Kings chapter 9. And so here, there's again an echo of people saying, you know what, I'm going to lay my cloak down on the baby donkey, which probably meant that the cloak could probably hit the ground, which is kind of funny too in itself. And then they start laying them out as they go down the road. Now it says they kept, continue, the way it's written in, in Greek is, you, what you do is you would put your cloak down, watch the donkey eat, uh, eat, uh, walk across it, and then you pick it up and you run in front and you try to catch it. There you go. And then it, it keeps going over and over again. <laughs> Some of you are laughing at that. All right. When I was a youth pastor, I used to make noises. I've been trying not to do that very much here. <laughs> Putting your cloak down on the ground is a symbol that he is the king. You can have speech, now it's action. And, and the second thing here is branches. People start waving palm branches or laying those down. This has divine, or this has royal implications, Right? When the Jewish priest Maccabeus defeated the pagan invaders, he cleansed the temple in 164 BC. His followers entered him, entered the city, waving palm branches in celebration. Our king is here. And then he went to the temple and set up a reign, uh, uh, a reign for lasted about a hundred years. So in that time, and that's what you celebrate at Hanukkah. That's what we celebrate, what, what Jewish people celebrate at Hanukkah was the Maccabean revolt. And, and so Waving palm branches was a symbol that there was another priestly king in Jerusalem. What about shouts from the crowd? Hosanna! Right? There's people, there's, there's, a, there's a grown man riding a little donkey going into a town. There's people putting a cloak down, watching him pass, going up and doing it again. And there's people on the side waving branches as his feet you know, drag on the floor on this little baby donkey because he's humble and lowly riding in. That's the a prophecy of the Old Testament. And now they're shouting, save now, Hosanna, save now. That's what it means. Lord, save us, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Anytime a New Testament writer puts a verse of the Old Testament in Scripture, they have kind of the larger context of that psalm or that verse in mind. And it continues to say, The Lord is God, and he made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. I mean, this is a procession. King Jesus is getting his procession into a city and the people are there into his capital city, being the son of David. And they're there and they're acknowledging it. And Mark's trying to say he's the true king. He also likes to answer this question of vocation. What does his kingship look like? Well, it's one of mercy, of salvation and healing and one of peace. Those are your next little fill in the blanks on your notes. His kingship looks like mercy, looks like salvation and looks like Peace. I love how the blind beggar says, have mercy on me. Mercy is getting what you don't deserve. Oh, sorry. No, no that's grace. Sorry, I get that mixed up. It's not getting what you deserve. And there's a sense in which that's the way Jesus operates as king. If you have fallen into sin, and that's all of us, Based on that definition, we're all deserving of wrath because of the sin in our lives. But God, who is rich in mercy, doesn't give us what we deserve, but instead offers grace. According to Ephesians, says it made us alive with Christ, seated us in the heavenly realms. Jesus is a king who shows mercy. God doesn't give us what we deserve. And that's all the man asks for. I just want some mercy. It's also the kingship of salvation. Remember when he's there with the blind man, he says, your faith, and according to my text, has made you well. But the word there is, is salvation, or some of you might say your faith has healed you. It's all kind of a similar wording, and so it's hard to really get the exact word right. But this word salvation has a lot of different meanings. It can mean save, like a physical rescue, like I'm saved from the, like, you know, the mouth of a lion or something like that. Or it could be the preservation of life or bodily healing or restoration or spiritual salvation. It could be the rescue from sin and death. And I think here, because it's closely connected to faith, it has all those meanings in one. Because he receives his physical healing and restoration, but he's also though, brought into a relationship with Jesus. And the only response to that is discipleship. I'm going to follow you all the way to Jerusalem. 
As he walks into the city or as he rides on that little baby donkey into the city, the whole crowd is chanting, save now, Lord, save us. They understand that when the king comes, salvation comes. But ultimately, though, his kingdom looks like a kingdom of peace. The humble king of Zechariah 9.9, the one riding on that little baby donkey, comes to proclaim peace to the nations. Jesus isn't like the kings they're used to. The Roman emperor would ride into town on a white stallion with soldiers behind him, just like the way he won the city. Come in and look how big I am. Look how amazing I am. I'm a white stallion, which means there's, there's no blemish on my record. We're coming in just the way we took the city. Come and cheer for me. The Romans believed that peace came through violent exercise of superior power. The peace that the Romans, cel- the Romans celebrated all right, was enforced with oppression. In other words, if you're going to try to, 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 to come against us, we're going to enforce our peace on you, or we're going to make you be peaceful people. But Jesus isn't like any other king. He rode into Jerusalem on a little baby donkey. And Mark's description highlights the extremes in the kingdoms here. The Roman emperor, white stallion, army soldiers coming back into the town. Come and celebrate me. We won the city I'm here, and now on the other side, it's this, it's this humble picture of a little baby donkey, like the ee ee baby donkey, feet dragging on the ground, people throwing their cloaks in front of him, palm branches waving. Save us now, save us now. Jesus brings peace, brings restoration, and ultimately the true peace that every human being needs because because of sin we are hostile toward God, enemies with God, but by the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, God restores the relationships with human beings and he reconciles us through the death and resurrection of his son, offering true peace. Humans are no longer hostile to God if they are in Christ because of what he's done on the cross. Amen, me and three other people in the room, I love it. That's good. The third way these two stories are combined is they answer this question of what does it mean to follow Jesus? So a question about discipleship. Three things, faith, obedience, and allegiance. Three things to show or to demonstrate whether or not you're following this king. The first one is faith. He says directly to the guy, your faith has healed you. Again, it's not about knowing the right words. It's not, about, it's not actually about throwing cloaks aside. It's about having faith enough in him to put everything aside. Because it's not just the actions that do it. It's the faith first and the actions that follow. Faith in Jesus is the key to discipleship. Now, we've been seeing this all along, right? For the last 35 weeks, it's where is your faith or your faith has healed you. We've seen that, that phrase a few times already in this passage. Your faith has healed you. It's all about faith. The next little thing is obedience. Jesus called the beggar, and the beggar came. Do you notice that? Jesus told the disciples to enter the city, and they went, right, to go get the colt. Remember, go ask for the colt. If they start asking you any questions, just say, the Lord needs it, and I'll just, well, he'll bring it back, right? <laughs> kind of a weird thing to say, right? Go into a city. You're going to find a little baby donkey. Just take it. If they ask you any questions, tell them it's from me. We'll bring it back. But they went and did that, right? Even in the weirdest commands, even in the weirdest instructions, they went. And they answered just as Jesus told them. I think you can't separate obedience from faith. I think faith is a way to say believing God enough to then do what he says, or belief, trust, obedience, that's faith. But here in the story, there's clear clear commands, and they go no matter what it's going to look like, no matter what the outcome is. They go, and eventually in the book of Matthew, it says they found everything just as Jesus said it would be. So following Jesus means having faith. It means having obedience. And ultimately, it, it it means having allegiance to him and to him alone. If he truly is a king heading into this capital city, Then allegiance is due to him and him alone. Now the beggar threw the cloak to the side, went to Jesus, received his sight, and then showed his allegiance to Jesus by what? By following him to Jerusalem. Following him all the way to the city. 
The rich young ruler couldn't do it a few weeks ago. In fact, Jesus said, well, there's one thing you lack. You have everything, but no, you actually lack one thing. Sell everything you have, give to the poor. And we talked about how that's not a universal call for everybody. It's just you need to take the idol that you have, that you've placed in the most important place in your life, and you need to throw that aside to follow me. And he couldn't do it. Here, this throwing down the cloaks, laying them in front of a donkey, that's a symbol of loyalty, of allegiance. Again, you don't do that for anyone except for a king. So allegiance to Jesus, faith, obedience, and allegiance to Jesus, even when things don't go the way we want them to go. And that's the toughest part. Because you could easily say, well, Brandon, there's a crowd there shouting, yay, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yay, Jesus is here, right? But then in a week, they're going to be the same crowd who says, crucify him. He wasn't the king we wanted. So even when things don't go the way we want, we have to put our allegiance in Jesus and him alone. Because yes, the crowds are stirring. Yes, the people are cheering. Yes, they're saying the right things in our passage. But again, in, in six days when he stands, or four, five days, not even a week, five days when he's in front of Pilate, they're going to yell, we don't want him anymore. You can nail him to the cross. So I want to leave us with three challenging questions. They're kind of based on those three different connections of the stories here. But the first one is, am I willing to accept King Jesus and his kingdom on his terms? And the reason why I phrased it like that is because I think a lot of us go, yeah, I like King Jesus. Sounds like pretty good, right? Coming to bring peace. He's, he's about love and mercy and, and justice, right? He's going to set things right. He sounds like an amazing king. But then, though, the second part is probably the hardest. But it's his kingdom. It's not, Jesus, you get to, you get to be a part of my kingdom, Right? I got, I got, I'm renting, I'm renting a castle, um, but I got a couple chariots, right? And I got two royal subjects. They look more like the queen than me, but, you know, anyways, I don't go, Jesus, my kids, okay, in case you didn't know that, okay. But they're not, Jesus isn't a part of my life. I've given my life fully to him. And it's his kingdom on his terms, what he says go, what he says goes, not, but can I do this, Lord? Can, because then he's not really Lord, he's just, something you've added on to your life. The second question, am I willing to call out to Jesus for salvation? We can't just pass by the blind beggar and just not mention the audacity of him to call out to Jesus, especially when they're like, just stop, be quiet. He's, he's on his way. He's got, he's got a task ahead of him. He's like, no, son of David, have mercy on me. Even more, the loud calls out for salvation, calls out for freedom, calls out to King Jesus. Am I willing to call out to him for salvation? And number three, am I willing to put everything to the side to follow King Jesus? Am I willing to lay down my property, lay down possessions, lay down security, lay down the things that I like to hold on to that are symbols of, of probably a higher level of importance in my life. The blind beggar it was an idol. For the man who is blind and begging, I don't know if it was an idol throwing aside the cloak, but it's pretty amazing. He's willing to do it, and he can't even see Jesus. He just knows enough about him. He has the insight just to get rid of it all. And here are these people, they probably don't know much about Jesus, but they know he's here, and they're realizing something amazing is happening, so they're willing to put their cloak down on a donkey and in front of a donkey, they're willing to show their allegiance to him. But these questions are true. They're all, those three questions, I don't know if you noticed them, but they're about who he is, his identity, his vocation, and what it means to follow him. So as we look at those three questions today and ponder that, the question is, are we willing to do those things, three things? And if we aren't, what's stopping us? What's hindering us? our acknowledgement of him and following his ways, what's hindering us from calling out for salvation? What's hindering us from putting things aside to say yes to follow him? He's going to be coronated as king. It's not going to be the way we would probably want it to happen. It's not going to be an amazingly lavish, beautiful ceremony, but actually the most brutal ceremony of all. But in the brutal, the brutality of a ceremony is the most beautiful gift of all. 
is eternal life with him because he defeated death on the cross and was raised to new life. And he's calling us to be a part of that today, to follow after him. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for you and your kingdom. We thank you for the way in which you lead as king. Challenge us, Lord, to go deeper with you. Call us, Lord. Speak to us. Speak clearly to us, Lord. There's, those, there's people in the room who are not yet following you. I know that, Lord, and I want you to call them right now. Tell them what kind of a king you are. Show the mercy that they need. Begin to soften hearts and call people to, it, to accept you for who you are and then to follow you deeply. And Lord, I, I ask, Lord, that our church would be a church that challenges people to walk with Jesus, to say, come and walk with Jesus with me. Do this life together. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, there's a couple things. I think I said it last service, but or earlier this morning is come back if you want to have that uh, meal after the next service. We're going to be having a lot of fun things outside, so come back for that. Um, on your way out, say hi to somebody who uh, can, I don't know, throw a cloak or wave a branch or something. I don't know. Have a good week. We'll see you next week.